I feel discouraged. Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven's home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. No, he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow. Let not your heart be troubled. His tender word I hear, and resting on his goodness, I lose my doubts and fears. Oh, by the path he leadeth, but one step I may see. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Whenever I am tempted, whenever clouds arise, when songs give place to sighing, when hope within me dies, Draw the closer to him, from care he sets me free, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he cares for me, his eye is on the sparrow. sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. Please remain standing as we pray for God to bless our tithes and offerings. Men, don't forget we have Master's Men coming up. Today is the due date for your uh, registration, $45 today. And then if you're playing golf, it's an extra $65. Come and see me. I have 11 guys signed up so far. Um, so come and see me, and uh, we can make sure that you are signed up, ready to go with us. It's May 19th, 20th, and 21st. It's going to be a fantastic time, a good fellowship. We might even be able to talk some people that have gone in the years past but have decided that the water business is going to keep them home. Oh, Not going to mention any names, but <laughs> just joking. All right. <clears throat> All right. So you may be seated. If you need to get your wallet out before you be seated, go ahead and grab that first to give to the offering. All right. <clears throat> Psalm 118 and verse 14, the Bible says, The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. Um, that reminded me of another verse over in Isaiah, Isaiah 26, 4. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. 
And are you trusting in the Lord with everything? You take a breath every morning. You, it's involuntary, but, you know, there's the trust there. You get in the car, drive to work, you have a trust that your car is going to, to make it. Maybe some of you are, don't have a lot of trust in that. <laughs> I know how that is. Um, you trust that uh, your kids are going to do well in school. You have a lot of trust and faith that you place in things. Are you placing your trust and faith in the Lord that he's going to be able to take care of you if you give back to him? He only asks for 10% back. That's so little. Think about that. On a dollar, that's only 10 cents. Now, if you're like pastor and you make a million dollars a year, you know, it's $100,000. So <laughs> praise the Lord. That's talking about real money, but you know what? It's the same percentage. <laughs> All right. We'll get on that. <laughs> we could pay our bills then. <laughs> All right. Well, you know what? You have the opportunity today to give back to what, what God has given to you. Praise the Lord. Uh, he's given you strength. You're here today. Maybe you don't feel like you're strong, but you're here. You made it out of the house. And uh, do you have a song on your lips like uh, the Bible's talking about in Psalm uh, 118.14? Is he your song? He's my salvation. Praise the Lord. I have salvation in him. If you're not saved today, that's your opportunity today. Behold, Today is the day of salvation. But today we have an opportunity to give back uh, in the offering just a little bit what he has given to us. And uh, let's have a word of prayer. We'll bless the offering and, and give. Remember to put your um, Master's Men registration in there and uh, talk to Mrs. Frank about the other. But let's think on these things. Is God your, your song and your salvation and your strength? Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to be in church today. Thank you for New Hope Baptist Church in Sonoma County, Lord. We praise your name for the many years that uh, this has been a lighthouse here. Lord, we praise your name for a pastor that's a full-time pastor. He doesn't have to work outside of uh, the church. And we praise your name for that opportunity for us to have a man of God that is uh, fully concentrating on the ministry. And Lord, I pray that you would bless him for that and his family. I pray that, Lord, you bless the givers that uh, give back just a little bit of what they, uh, that you've given to them. We pray that you would bless them immensely and open the, the, the windows of heaven and pour down the blessings upon them. Lord, I pray that you would help these that may be struggling in this area of tithing and giving back. I pray that you would see that you, uh, help them to see that you can be their strength and that they can trust in you, uh, for you are our everlasting strength, Lord. We pray that you bless the message today. We pray that you would speak to each one of us. We pray that, Lord, if there's one here that is unsure of where they'd go today, if they were to die today, if they go to heaven or hell, I pray that today they trust Jesus Christ and the, the amazing gift he gave by dying on the cross for us, but not staying dead, Lord, but rising again. We'll praise your name for what you do today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. If you know the chorus, Melody. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. 
Thank you, sister. First Chronicles chapter 16, if you will, please. First Chronicles chapter 16. You know, we're often told that uh, Jehovah in the Old Testament is, is so harsh and so judgmental. And the enemies of the Bible, the enemies of Christianity will point out uh, the commands of the Lord, which, which they equate to uh, ethnic cleansing, you know, and, and, uh, and completely wiping out whole populations. And I think that if we were to put ourselves in the place at the time, we would understand exactly why God would issue such commands, which to us seem uh, so overbearing, so draconian. And yet I believe there is very real, very common sense reasons why God had to issue such commands. And I believe it was no pleasure on his part, just out of pure necessity. But nonetheless, when people look at the Old Testament, they almost sometimes wonder, is, is, is like they're like a different God in the Old Testament, this, this, this judgmental, harsh, angry God versus the God of love we see in the New Testament, you know, uh, most, most, most readily presented by the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you that he's one and the same God. And it's Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we, we have in Jehovah, we have a loving God. And we have a, we have a merciful God. And we, we have a God who provides it for his own and, and who loves and cares for his people. And we see that universally all the way through. And yet we also know that we have a God who will deal with things very harshly, uh, very directly as necessary, because that is what we as his creatures need. We, we need him sometimes to, to, to handle us with a stern hand. But what you see is, is throughout the Old Testament, the constant drumbeat of this refrain, for his mercy endureth forever. It, it's not a refrain of, man, you know, watch out, look out, you know, God's out to get you. He's going he's to uh, come down on it like a ton of bricks. He's, he's going to be heavy, heavy on you. Now, there are obviously the warnings in Scripture. And those are there for our good, for our admonition. But all the way through, people who are just like you and me, people who messed up and had to have God chastise them and deal with them and, and, and correct them, nonetheless, when it's all said and done, they had to confess his mercy endureth forever. You're holding here in First Chronicles chapter 16 to lead into this. Let me just describe to you that there is an object that God had his people make as they were journeying out of Egypt through the wilderness, and it was called the Ark of the Covenant. Not to be confused with Noah's Ark, the great ship by which the Lord preserved eight souls and two, two of every kind of creature except for the clean animals that were used for sacrifice and for human consumption. And of those, there were seven of each. And, and that's how all those species were saved and how humanity was saved was on that Ark. We're not speaking of that Ark. This was like a great chest, or if you will, a box made of a special hardwood that was then covered within and without with pure gold. And it symbolized the very presence of God in the midst of his people. Over time, God had a, a sample of manna, that miraculous daily bread-like substance, that food that would appear miraculously every morning for the Jews as they traveled through the wilderness. He had a container of manna inside the ark. He also had Aaron's rod, his walking stick, if you will, that he had used through, through his life. And there came a point at which when it came down to a matter of authority and who really was to be the high priest, who was to really be the spokesman of God, uh, one day the Lord had each uh, uh, representative of the tribes come and bring their walking stick, bring their rod, set it before the tabernacle. And the next day, Aaron's dead stick budded. It came to life, and it showed God's favor upon Aaron as high priest of Israel. And that rod that budded was also carried within the ark. So there just otherwise it was it was a, it was an empty chest, just those couple of items within it. But it symbolized the presence of God in the midst of His people. And so there was a tabernacle made, kind of like a big tent-like structure, that had uh, an outer court, and then where the priests would gather and do their business. And then there was a holy place where they would, where, where they would gather. Uh, and, and so the outer court, the, uh, the Levites, who, who are a tribe of Israel dedicated to serving Jehovah, they were allowed in. The holy place, only the priests among the Levites were allowed in. Then the holiest 
place, the Holy of Holies, into which only the high priest of Israel was allowed once a year to make a very special sacrifice on behalf of all Israel. So there was this tabernacle. Well, after David became king, he, and he made Jerusalem his capital city. Seven years he was in Hebron, then for the next 33 years he was in Jerusalem. And when he made Jerusalem his capital city, he wanted the tabernacle, and he most of all wanted the Ark of the Covenant near him. He wanted the presence of God near him. And so he made arrangements to bring the, the Ark of the Covenant. And so there came that point at which the Ark finally arrived in Jerusalem. And we see here in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, in verse number 1, So they brought the Ark of God and set it in the midst of the tent that David had pitched for it, or if you will, a new tabernacle. And they offered burnt sacrifices and peace offerings before God. And when... David had made an end of offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings. He blessed the people in the name of the Lord. Verse number four, verse four, and he appointed certain of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord and to record and to thank and praise the Lord God of Israel. So what a job that would be, man. It's my job, my full-time job, just to remember God's blessings upon our people and record the things that God's doing for us and then to thank him for those things and to praise him for it continuously. Verse number seven. Then on that day, David delivered first this psalm to thank the Lord into the hand of Asaph and his brother. And Asaph was a chief musician. And so starting at verse number eight, David had given a psalm that begins in verse eight. He'd given it to Asaph so they could begin to practice it and begin to sing it before God and before the people of God. I want you to notice, beginning of verse 8, this psalm begins, and I want to point out 10 things that we should do as the people of God. All right, beginning of verse number 8, number 1, give thanks unto the Lord. Number 2, call upon his name. Number 3, make known his deeds among the people. I, it makes me think very much of a Sunday school teacher. Number four in verse nine, sing unto him, sing psalms unto him. That's a command that, that we have no option there. That's what God wants, what pleases him. Number five in verse nine, talk ye of all his wondrous works. Verse 10, number six, glory ye in his holy name. And far from being ashamed of being Christians, we should revel in the name of Christ. And, and feel such honor that we are attached to the name Jesus and we get to be known by his name as Christians. In verse number seven, I'm sorry, number seven, verse 10, number seven, let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. So we're to be a rejoicing people, a happy people, a joyful people. Verse number 11 and it comes to the item number eight, seek the Lord and his strength. Number nine, seek his face continually. So it's not just once, nor even once in a while, but we're to constantly seek the face of God, which tells me then he's not equally available to all. Like it or lump it, uh, there, there are times in certain situations where the face of God is turned toward you and the face of God is turned away from you. There's times when he is accessible to you, times when not accessible to you. And it's not because he is somehow finicky you know, and, and hard to approach. It has much more to do with, with you and me and how we are pleasing or displeasing him. And so we're to seek his face. That, that should be an object of ours. Man, I, I, I want God's face turned toward me, and I want to get to know him better, and I want his favor, and I want to, get, I want to be close to the Lord. And, and then the tenth item is, item is in verse number 12, remember. Remember. Remember what? Remember his marvelous works that he hath done. Remember his wonders. Remember the judgments of his mouth. And that's recorded for you in the word of God. So the things he's done, you remember. The wonderful, miraculous things he's done for you in your life, don't let them slip on by. Don't forget them. Remember them and utilize that memory at times when you are discouraged or when you are wondering, where is God? You've got to remember, oh, no, he's there. He's there. He's shown himself marvelous, wonderful in the past. And then remember the judgments of his mouth, what God expects of you. Dropping down to verse 28, verse 28. 
Give unto the Lord, ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Verse 34. Verse 34 says, O oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Why? How do you know that he is good? It's right there. We're to give thanks to the Lord for he is good. How do I know he's good? His mercy endureth forever. Verse 35, and say ye, save us, O God, of our salvation, and gather us together, and deliver us from the heathen, that we may give thanks to thy holy name and glory in thy praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel forever and ever. And all the people said amen and praise the Lord. So we're to give thanks to the Lord. He is good. His mercy endureth forever. And he's a God, his, his mercy is always there. It's always available. It's accessible. Now, you may feel like at a given time in your life, you're not sensing the mercy of God. And there are times we do go through chastisement. And there are times when, when because of our own disobedience, there's, a, there, there's something of an alienation from the Lord. There's, a, there's, there's a, a, a separation because I've drifted away. He didn't leave me. I left him. And I've got to close that. You've got to work at closing that gap. But, but I'm saying that the point is, his mercy is always hovering. It's always there. It endures forever. Hey, it endures when I'm behaving myself, and it endures when I'm rotten. The mercy is still there. Now, now I, may, I may remove myself from access to it, but it's still there. It's still available. The mercies remain, and, it, and, and they're, they're everlasting. It's, it's mercy endureth forever. The reason why I'm not going to go to hell is not, it has nothing to do with me. It has to do with me trusting in his finished work upon Calvary, and his mercy toward me will endure forever. And, and his mercy is always there. Now, it, as a result of that, in verse 35, there are times when you do find yourself in trouble, you do find yourself facing trials, you do find yourself in the storms of life, and you say, hey, God of our salvation, in a general sense, save us specifically in this instance, in this matter I'm facing at this moment. And, and we're asking for your deliverance. And the reason we're doing it is not just so the pressure's off me, not just so I have a good life, not just so that, that I can just go back to you know, being brain dead again and, and, and forget about you again and ignore you again. No, I'm asking you to do this that I can have another cause to give thanks to your holy name, and I can glory in your praise. And then David said, you are to make the Lord God of Israel happy with you. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. We want him pleased. Now the people responded with what word? They said amen. Amen is an oral acknowledgement of truth. That's why we use it around here. That's why we're, we're very comfortable with it, and we utilize it. And, and I love it when, when we say amen, because it's saying that is right, that is true. And more than that, it's an indication that I am submitted to that truth. And that could be why when Brother Frank wants to talk about tithing, it's very quiet in here. Because there are those who want to acknowledge the truth, but they're not wanting to submit to it. And you sense that hypocrisy, you, would, you, would, you don't want to be a hypocrite, so you, you stand there mute. And, uh, you know, where we, so we talk about different subjects. The reason why some get excited and they want to confirm that publicly and openly with some kind of an ejaculation, amen, glory to God, preach it, that's right, yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's very appropriate in, in, this, in such a setting. But it's, it's not just saying that's right, but it's saying that's either what I am doing or that's what I, I will admit I need to get back to doing. It's the right thing for me to do, and that's what I want to do. Verse number 37. So he left there before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, Asaph and his brethren. He so he left those men there to minister before the ark continually as every day's work required. So their job was to praise the Lord on behalf of the king and, and the people. Verse number 40. Their job included to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord upon the altar of the burnt offering continually morning and evening, just as you and I, I are to send up a sweet-smelling savor to, to our Lord morning and evening. 
some time carved out of your busy schedule where you're giving the incense of praise and prayer to your Lord. You're making that sacrifice of time and you're turning your attention away from something your flesh wants to do something which is pleasing to your Savior. And it says there in verse 40, and to do according to all that is written in the law of the Lord, which he commanded Israel, and with them Heman and Jeduthun. And I just want to make right here a dogmatic statement. Don't you notice in verse number 41, the He-Man loves the Lord. Amen? The, the real He-Man loves to serve the Lord. So I would say, what did what'd you come out away with in church this morning? What was your takeaway? Think He-Man. I want to be a He-Man for Jesus. Uh, and I hope that's more than just our ladies who are doing that, you know. Uh, uh, so anyway, there's that He-Man in verse 41. And the rest that were chosen, who were expressed by name, to give thanks to the Lord. Why? Yeah, I'm glad we have one person this side and one person that side. Look at their Bible in verse 41. Now they were to give thanks to the Lord. Why? Thank you. That's right. Because his mercy endureth forever. That's worth thanking God for. Beloved, I need that mercy. As hard as I try, I'm always going to come short of perfection. Now I understand perfection in the sense of spiritual maturity. I'm to strive for that. But I'm, I'm always going to come short of sinless perfection while I'm in a body of flesh. He has every reason, every right to, to zap me with a, a bolt of lightning or have the earth open up and I fall into the pit or you know I have an accident or I get a dread disease or whatever. By the way, if any of those things have happened to you, I'm not claiming that somehow it's necessarily the punishment of God or, or, or his chastisement. There are many reasons why God leads us through difficulties. But, I, but I'm just glad that you know I deserve that perpetually. And I marvel at how good God is to me and to my wife and to our family and to our church. I marvel at the goodness of God. His mercy endureth forever. Let's take a moment to pray. Lord Jesus, bless us now through the balance of the message. And I pray that, that as this is given to us throughout the scriptures in the Old Testament to show what a good and gracious God you have always been. Whether it's the Old Testament, Jehovah, or the New Testament, Jesus, God is always good. And we love you, Lord. And I pray that what'll, what we will leave with here today indelibly, indelibly imprinted upon our minds is your mercy endures forever. And may we be grateful for it, see evidences of it in our lives, and thank you and praise you continuously for your goodness, which is so much more than we deserve. It is your grace. It is your mercy. And we thank you for it this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Take your Bible, turn a little bit further into the Old Testament, into 2 Chronicles chapter 5. 2 Chronicles chapter 5. Now, David had his tabernacle. Of course, Moses had the tabernacle. It eventually was replaced by the tabernacle that David built in Jerusalem for the Ark of the Covenant. But then his son Solomon was allowed to build a formal, actual, permanent structure, the temple in Jerusalem. And there in the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant, overshadowed by two great... Uh, statues that were cherubim or angelic beings that had their wings outspread so that on the one side one touched the wall on one side and then touched the cherubim next to him on the other side and that cherubim touched and then touched the wall on the other side and they both hovered over the Ark of the Covenant. And that Ark of the Covenant became a mercy seat and became as it were a throne where, where, the, where the presence of God was centered. And I realize God is omnipresent He's everywhere all the time. But he chooses to be in certain places at certain times in a special way, in an extraordinary way. You can sense that sometimes when you are outside of a church like ours, and especially if you're outside our society, which, is, which has been so thoroughly inundated with biblical truth. But you go some places outside our country and out of our culture, and you can sense the oppressiveness there. Of, you're in Satan's playground. You're on his turf. You can tell it. 
Some of you have been in third world situations with the military, or maybe you were raised in a third world situation, or maybe you visited family in, in some of the parts of, of, of say, Mexico that are, that are totally dominated by the Roman Catholic Church or by the indigenous religions. You have sensed that God's not there like he is here this morning. And so he was there in a very special way, there at that mercy seat. So we come into 2 Chronicles chapter 5 and verse 1. Uh, the, the temple is now being completed that Solomon had made. And it says in verse 1, Thus all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in all the things that David his father had dedicated, and the silver and the gold and all the instruments, the instruments being both musical instruments and, and instruments in the, in the sense of the implements used to do the work of God, the sacrifices and so forth. And he put, uh, he, put he, Solomon put, among the treasures of the house of God. Verse 2, then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes and the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel unto Jerusalem to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord uh, out of the city of David, which is Zion. So it's time now to put it specifically inside the Holy of Holies in the temple. Verse number 5, and they brought up the Ark and the tabernacle of the congregation and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle. These did the priests and the Levites bring up. Verse 7, and the priests brought in the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord unto his place to the oracle of the house into the most holy place, what we know as the Holy of Holies, even under the wings of the cherubims. Verse 13, verse 13, and it came, it came even to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one. One great musical, uh, looking for the right word, I want to say noise. Yeah, and I'm even avoiding cacophony because it, it still it's kind of speaks of noise. Right. But one great blast of music, one great blast of melody. Would you suggest, Brother Preston? For it. A, a great chorus of sound. But I want to flourish. And you guys are good. I'm going to have Preston, Preston and John right here. And, and uh, man, that's even better than the on, online thesaurus. So, uh, and what, we say, what's a thesaurus? It's, it's a man about 60 plus, 70 years old, who spouts off. He's an old dinosaur that spouts out words to help you. And so that's a thesaurus. And so, uh, yeah, the great flourish of beautiful sound. That, we're not talking about like in a rock concert. We're not talking about in modern so-called praise and worship and the average church of the day. But it was, it, was, it was a great unified sound of vo voices and instruments. And there were symbols. And, it, and it was all, the purpose of it in verse 13 further in was that they praised the Lord saying, now find it here toward the end of verse 13, for he is what? He is good. How do we know that he is good? Amen. That even, that, that, that then the house was filled with a cloud even the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. God's very presence filled that place like a cloud. Remember, he led the children of Israel through the wilderness by a pillar of cloud. It's one of the manifestations of God. And he, his presence filled that place to the point that the priests were whether it's by fear or inability to breathe or, or just being overawed, they just could not remain there. They had to step away. They had to get out of the, ta of the temple as the Lord filled that place. And it all was triggered when they cried out how the Lord is good. His mercy endureth forever. At that point, that's the point at which God made his special presence known. I wonder how, many, how much more we would sense God in our lives if we acknowledge how good God is. Instead of always harping on what we don't have and what we're lacking. And, and if we got our eyes off from that, and by the way, that would sound pretty pathetic up, up against a, a, a Christian serving God today in the third world. And you, you, are, you are so stinking rich, it, it's, it's, it's shocking. The poorest person in our church is so far above the, the world norm, the world average. You don't have to survive on a dollar or two a day. You, you, you get to drink pure water instead of water out of a creek bed or a river or a marsh filled with, with bacteria. You don't have to worry. You, you're, not, you're in a place, you don't have to worry about malaria here. My son is in a place right now where that there's, 
you know, we're just hoping he comes out of it with his son without either the, what's it called, the Zika flu or malaria or some other. Then they've been swimming in rivers. They've been drinking the water, probably breaking all the rules. We're hoping that he doesn't get dysentery or, you know, anything of that nature. And, uh, but that's what they live with, those people. That's what Joey Ando lives with in the Philippines and the other pastors there. That's, what they, that's, that's how they live. That's what they deal with. I was just reading today an article from a couple of years ago in Nepal, the, the great earthquake in Nepal. 9,000 people killed and, and how it impacted the Christians. And, and one brother mentioned, he said, I, uh, a pastor there, and he, and, and he said, I had no immediate family died, but there was extended family, aunts, uncles, cousins, and so forth that were killed in the earthquake, homes demolished, churches unusable, uh, savings of a lifetime, all the little things you, you accumulate, all gone in minutes and, and buried under rubble. And beloved, we, we just have it so good in so many ways. And so when we acknowledge that, his mercy, I think then there's much more of the presence of God you're gonna sense. Hey, isn't it true for you that when someone is always telling you the worst about yourself, you don't exactly feel, or, or how you're not providing, how you're not doing your job, you don't feel real chummy. You don't feel real huggy, huggy, kissy, kissy, that kind of person. Man, it's just like you're, you're, you're wanting to back away and say, fine, if that's how it is, then I, 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 I'm sorry. I'm, I'll just become less and less a presence in your life. Excuse me for living, <laughs> you know. And... Whereas the person who's constantly expressing appreciation and gratitude and they acknowledge the little things you do, man, you're wanting to get closer and closer to that person. You gravitate to that person. Turn place to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. We're bypassing chapter 6. That's Solomon's great prayer of dedication of the temple. We come into chapter 7 and verse number 1. Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the priests could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement. Now, isn't, now just pause right there. Isn't that interesting? This is real worship. It's not jumping up and down. It's not going into an ecstasy. It, it's, it's not dancing. It is a profound awe that drives you to your face before God. And it says, it goes on in verse 3 to say, they bowed themselves their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, for he is good. And how do you know that he is good? Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, after Solomon passed away, the kingdom, I won't go into all the details, but the kingdom of Israel was, was divided. There was, the, in essence, a, a civil war. And although not with, fortunately not with a war, but just there was just a political division. And ten tribes went their own way and retained the name Israel. Two tribes were abandoned uh, to the heirs of David, and that was known as the kingdom of Judah. That was still based in Jerusalem. And you see then a history of the kingdom of Judah that continues on from that point through the balance of its history. It goes something like this. Regression, repression, revival, relief, reparation, repose. And then they go right back into where, where they would, they would uh, regress once again. So in other words, regression. They, they, would, they would, if you will, they'd backslide on the Lord. And so the Lord would have to deal with them. He'd have to send, you know, some kind of bad things to happen, and they'd go through a time of repression. Then when they're down and, and realizing how they blew it, they'd come back to God in revival, and they would experience relief. God would repair the situation. The people would relax, kick back, repose. And before you know it, they're drifting away from God, back into lethargy, Back, in, back into uh, you know, messing around with those things that God was, did not approve of, and they would regress, and then it would all happen again. That was the cycle. Well, we, they had a good king named Jehoshaphat who tried to bring the country back. It was one of those times of revival. 
They tried to bring the country back. But even so, you know, sometimes when we try to get things straight with God, there's still ongoing consequences from the past. All right? You get saved or you get right with God. It doesn't necessarily mean that all, that, all, that bad, all those bad bills and your overspending is not just going to be wiped out in a moment. Oh, God's, okay, well, let's just, let's just clear a slate then. Hey, if I've got bills, if I've got uh, to deal with alimony, if I've got to deal with child support, if I've got to deal with uh, criminal uh, things that are, that are hovering there in my past, they can still come back to bite me. It's just that the difference is before I'd have to deal with it myself. Now I've got him helping me through this. But I, was, I just, I just want to avoid us getting into some idea that, uh, man, you, know, you get saved, you get right with God, everything just, just goes, you know, push the reset button, everything just goes back to fine and dandy. Not necessarily, only in, in a spiritual sense is it fine and dandy. Some practical aspects of life you may still have to struggle with for, for, for some time to come. Well, things were set in motion where God was going to deal with his people. Even though Jehoshaphat worked, worked a degree of revival in his country, they still had to pay the piper when it came to some decisions and choices that had been made in the past. So it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1, It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon, and with them beside the, the Ammonites, came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Then there came some and told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude, I mean two kingdoms plus some more allies on their side, coming up against us. So there cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on the side of Syria. And behold, they be in Hazan Tamar. So in other words, Hazazan Tamar. They're closing in. They're up to En Gedi. They're closing in on us. Verse 3, and Jehoshaphat feared. Now, beloved, that is a natural human reaction. I don't blame you if you find out you're dealing with cancer that you fear. I don't blame you if you find out your child has a dread disease that you fear. I don't blame you if you lose your job, you fear. All right? That is a natural human reaction. It's just deciding whether or not you're going to dwell there. That's going to become your new address. I'm now going to live in fear. But the fear, if it drives you the right way, can turn out to be a good thing in your life. Because in the case of Jehoshaphat, he feared and set himself to seek the Lord. Beyond that, he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. No, no food for a span of time to show God that we're serious about this. We really do want to please you. Verse 4, and Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to do what? To seek the Lord. Verse number 13, and all Judah stood, I'm sorry, I'll give you a chance to catch up there. Verse 13, I'm watching the clock, so I'm, I'm pushing me a little too hard. Verse 13, and all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones and their wives and their children. Verse 20, so if you're getting weary, you're not having to stand. <laughs> you know, a lot of times in the Old Testament, they stood and listened to preaching and, uh, and, or the reading of the word of God, sometimes for a whole day. Verse 20, and they rose early in the morning and went forth in the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Right now, they're being, their very existence is being threatened. He's saying, Believe in Jehovah. He is your God. You believe in him, he'll, 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 he will establish you. He'll, he'll give us longevity. He'll help us survive. Then he says at the end of verse 20, believe his prophets and so shall ye prosper. This morning, beloved, I don't know if I can proclaim myself a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I will say this, if you'll listen to your pastor, you'll stay in the game. You'll stay in the battle. You'll keep going. So oftentimes where people get messed up is when they throw in the towel and they give up on a relationship or they give up on a, on a situation prematurely. And, it, and if you just would listen to the word of God being preached would keep you going to give God the time and the opportunity to, to intervene and to help turn things around. Hey, it took you time to make your mess. Why do we always expect instantaneous deliverance? It, it may take time. I, I know God is God and he could just, well, boom. That's, I'm just telling you, typically, that's why we say the Bible, to find out how God, not how you would like him to work, not how some charismatic preacher says he thinks God, God works, but what the Bible reveals as far as how God works. 
Verse number 21. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, that they should praise the beauty of holiness. So they went out before the army and to say, praise the Lord. Why? Yeah. Hey, they went in front of the army. Now, uh, we don't recommend this strategy for Afghanistan because we are not a nation it, with this kind of relationship with, with the Lord Jesus Christ. But, but it worked in this age where God's, it was, Israel was God's people. And so what went out first was not skirmishers. What went out first was not, was not the, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, who are the guides, the, the scouts. It wasn't scouts. It, and why would you come up with another S? It wasn't skirmishers. It wasn't scouts. It was, what's that? Ah, it wasn't snipers. Yeah. Or sappers. Yeah. But it was, <laughs> what went out front of the army were singers. Now yeah, we're a god of it. Yes, 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 yes. Woo. And so, <laughs> weird stuff get a preacher excited. You had to understand, you know. When your whole life is about words, you just you get into weird stuff. So, uh, anyway. <laughs> it's like, what was it, Larry? You you were on you were on a roll this uh, here during your time. You had three S's going. I was always like, I gotta write this down, man. It's salvation. Oh man, see, that's why you gotta write it down. It's the three things. <laughs> All right. So yes. So they sent these guys out front, and they were they were praising the Lord for His mercy endureth forever. Verse twenty two. And when they began to sing and to praise and to praise. The Lord sent, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. And I think we could see more miraculous deliverances in our lives from the Lord if we praised Him more and complained a lot less. Praise Him more. You know, what father doesn't? My dad is so great. He's so handsome. He deserves Son, you ain't said nothing yet. <laughs> Man, you know, you, you, the more you're praised, the more you want to perform. Verse, uh, would you please go to Ezra chapter 3 and verse 10. Ezra chapter 3 and verse 10. We'll see if we can squeeze in the next several minutes here. As you come to Ezra chapter 3, Judah was eventually conquered by Babylon. They backslid one time too many, went a little too far. God finally said, enough's enough. You need a prolonged period. Uh, our captivity was the years 1985 to 1987 in our marriage. As a result of my backsliding, as a result of my bad decisions, we went into a two-plus-year captivity, uh, and which we hope we never will have to ever go through again, anything like it. But for them, it was 70 years. And then they were allowed to return and to rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. We're told in Ezra chapter 3 and verse number 10, verse 10, and when the builders laid the foundation of the temple, the Lord, remember the temple had been destroyed by the Babylonians, so a new temple is being erected. When they laid the foundation, they set the priests in their apparel with, the, with instruments. So it's, guys, get out of your work duds, get into your, get into your priestly attire, and which is also interesting that there's apparently a way to dress when you're doing the things of God, in a way to not dress you doing the things of God. And in verse 10 it says, And the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with symbols, to do what? To praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. Now, beloved, this marks a good tradition. Don't, don't, don't be freaked out by the, name, by the word tradition. Oh, Jesus was so against tradition. He was against the tradition of the Pharisees that was against the commands of God. A bad tradition is anything that goes contrary to the Bible. A good tradition is something that reinforces the Bible. So is there anything in the Bible that says, thou shalt have Sunday school? No. So a lot of churches, they have abandoned Sunday school. It's a tradition. Now we ask, is it a bad tradition or a good tradition? Well, if it's taking us away from the Bible, we ought to get rid of it. But if it's just a matter of I'm too lazy to get up in the morning... Or I can't find anybody in our church with enough character to want to teach our children Bible truth. Uh, look, if it's a good tradition in, in which it's fulfilling a biblical command and we're to teach the Bible to our people, especially our children, then it's worth retaining. doesn't matter what the other churches do. 
and so with evening service and so with midweek service and so with prayer meetings and so with, with, with our soul winning and, and so with so many, so much of what we do, if it's a good tradition, let's, let's retain it. And so these guys retained this tradition they received from David and they, they praised the Lord. Now I want you to notice how they praised him. It says with symbols after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. They had trumpets in verse 10. They had symbols. You know, it doesn't look, though, like it was a concert like what Nebuchadnezzar had when he erected his image. And he had uh, all the people bow down to his image. Wow. So what happened was, the Hebrews had been in Babylonian captivity for 70 years, but when they came back, they did not praise God with Babylonian music. They retained Hebrew music. I emphasize this right now because we're not going to praise our God, our holy and righteous God, our pure and loving Savior, using Egyptian or worldly or Babylonian music. We're going to keep it where it is recognizable as the songs of Zion. Distinct. I think if we went out in the parking lot and we said, hey, let's attract some Vertex people. Let's sing some of our songs. They would say, no, that's not our music. If we were attracting them over because they heard us rocking out, some would rejoice. Oh, look, we got more young people in the church. Oh, look, you know, they're hearing the gospel. But can I say that they're being brought under a false pretense, under false colors? And I question in the long run how much really is being accomplished by that. Anyway, just, just to put that out there to you. Now, verse 11, and they sang together by course. In other words, it was decently and in order. There was an orderliness to it. So they, they, it, it wasn't just a loud, rambunctious noise. It, there was, it was very much like our song service. It was a song we'd sing together. And then another song we'd sing together. And then a special by Mrs. Scott, uh, uh, the offertory. And then perhaps a special number by somebody. And it's, in, it's by course. And it was all done in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord. Wow, I think that's a big difference right there. It's one thing for it to be the spotlight's on me and I want to impress you with how I love Jesus oh oh just how I love Jesus oh can I say that is all about me versus me being willing to humble myself a little bit and sing and I want to do a good job and I practice to do a good job and the instrumentals must do a good job and I want to do a good job but we don't have to do any theatrics I don't have to sway. I don't have to swallow the microphone. I don't have to do any of this, this, this other. I mean, I, I, it's just straight to the Lord. Now, why am I emphasizing this? I do, because <laughs> I'm seeing how many of our people are being razzled, dazzled by this entertainment-based Christianity and being drawn into it, but they're not lasting, nor are their children. It is a stepping stone back into the world. Anyway, that's what we're not seeing. With all the emphasis on contemporary Christianity, we're not seeing revival. Some, there are some megachurches out there, but it's not impacting the culture, at least not in a positive sense. So anyway, we're in verse 11. They sang by course and praising and giving thanks to the Lord. And why did they praise and give thanks to the Lord? Why? Because he's good. And how do you know he's good? Mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And by the way, we can have a good time with it. All the people did what? They did. Bless God. They shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. You know, there's three groups of Christians that are going to be in heaven. The one is going to be bummed like, dude, it's not a concert. Whoa. I just like sing like hymns up here. 
And there's gonna be another group going, oh, oh, it's just so crazy up here. These people are, they're shouting. They're just, oh, it's just, I can't believe it. And then there's gonna be the third group, the, the Baptists. <laughs> I love this, yes. I've spent my lifetime getting ready for this. It's our music, it's our savior, it's, it's our Bible, it's our way of doing, anyway. All the people shouted when they praised the Lord. Because of, now, because you guys got me off on so many rabbit trails, we're going to stop right there. And, yeah, I'll close with this. David used his psalms. And we'll, see, we'll see this again maybe in a future week. Well, yeah, I think there's enough here to justify it. Let's just go back and review this. David used his psalms to teach his people repeatedly to, number one, give thanks unto the Lord. Number two, call upon his name. Number three, make known his deeds among the people. Number four, sing unto him. Sing psalms unto him. Number five, talk ye of all his wondrous works. Number six, glory ye in his holy name. Number seven, let the heart of man rejoice that seek the Lord. Number eight, seek the Lord in his strength. Number nine, seek his face continually. Number ten, Remember his marvelous works that he hath done. Remember his wonders. Remember the judgments of his mouth. And give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. How do you know he's good? Father, thank you for teaching us this, this morning. And I pray that a number of things were accomplished in this message. It helped us to remember how good you are. You do, your, your mercies are great every morning. Your mercies are greater than our iniquities. Your mercies are the very reason why you're, you're willing to give us the good news called the gospel. And by your grace, you're willing to receive us through a simple act of faith in the finished work of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for all this. We thank you that once we're saved, your mercy continues. You have every reason to cut us all off for doing despite the spirit of grace. All the occasions we trod underfoot the blood that was shed for our sins. How we took advantage of the spirit of grace and did despite unto you. And yet, Lord, you've been merciful, merciful, and ever more merciful. And we thank you for that. We're grateful for the times of chastening. We're grateful for the times of strengthening. But we're also grateful that far more often than not, your response to us is that of mercy. Thank you for it. We're also grateful, Lord, for the contrast made between those who properly and inappropriately praise you. And I pray, God, that we will continue to utilize, not in a pharisaical fashion, but, Lord, just acknowledging what we see in the scriptures and choosing to continue to be a peculiar people, even to be, Lord, a peculiar people within a peculiar people. And, Lord, we love our brethren. Some of, some of what they do breaks our hearts. We, we, we wish they'd come back to the old paths. But, Lord, uh, we, we are going to continue on ourselves. And we think that is that which most pleases you. Lord, I pray this morning, if anyone here is not yet saved, may this be the day of their salvation. I pray, God, if anyone here is saved but not yet baptized, we're ready for a baptism. I wonder if there's someone here that it was all done for that one person's benefit. If so, move upon that heart to come and, and surrender to biblical baptism. But whatever happens, we give you praise and glory for what we've experienced and learned together this morning. In Jesus' name. Let's stand together, please, beloved. The altar is open. If you need salvation, come and see me right away. Or if you need baptism, likewise, come and let that be known. We're ready to go. We'd be delighted. I'd be honored to be the pastor to get to baptize you. Let me know if that's a need. The invitation continues. You're welcome to use the altar and pray. And if you're able to, turn with me to hymn number 161, 161, we'll sing softly and tenderly.
161. Please join me on verse 1. Softly and tenderly Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why should we linger and heed not his mercies, mercies for you and for me? Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home, earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. Time is now fleeting, the moments are passing, passing from you and from me. Shadows are gathering, deathbeds are coming, coming for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. For the wonderful love he has promised, promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon, pardon for you and for me. Come home. Thank you for being in church today. We're going to pray as we dismiss and look forward to having you back in the evening service at 6 o'clock. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to come to church. Thank you, Lord, for the chance to be reminded that your mercy endureth forever. And God, I pray that you would help us to continue to worship you so that, uh, Lord, we can have those mercies. I pray that you would bless us to bless those that are here today and help us to be back tonight in the evening service, that we would have a baptism. And God, I just pray that you would um, help us to remember you throughout the week. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being in church today. You're dismissed.